Well, good morning and thank you for coming out um, on this beautiful Saturday morning to, uh, to talk about something that is critically important to Wisconsin. I, back when I was a district attorney in Waukesha County, I made this our number one, well, excuse me, I didn't make it. This issue made itself number one concern for us in Waukesha County. And when I went on to, uh, to become attorney general, it, it has made itself number one for the state of Wisconsin. This is the most serious public safety and public health crisis we've experienced ever. Let's take a look at what it's all about. These are the numbers in Wisconsin, and I suspect Dr. McNett might have done some of these things too, but I want to point out this graph here. These are opiate deaths in Wisconsin between 2000 and 2013. We had about a 500% increase. Could you imagine what we would do if we saw traffic crash deaths increase by 500%? We would put a roundabout every 200 feet. We would drop speed limits to 15. We'd raise the driving age to 30. We would do whatever, whatever it took to turn this around. We've been slow coming around. I want to say that I'm very proud of what's been happening in Wisconsin, our medical community, our business community, government, all parts, legislative, executive, judicial, all the branches, law enforcement, everybody, treatment community, we've all been on board to do some really bold things in Wisconsin and it's going to make a difference. But it took us a long time to get here and it's going to take a long, it's going to take some work to get us out too. What we're doing at the Department of Justice is focusing on a prevention and awareness campaign. We are absolutely still focusing tremendous resources on law enforcement but we will not arrest our way out of this problem. We need, we need to stop the flow in. And the way we're going after this problem with our prevention campaign is by going after the myths. The biggest myth we're battling is the myth that people have that prescription medications, they can't be addictive, they can't be dangerous because a doctor prescribes them. They actually have it backward, right? The reason why we require a prescription is because they can be dangerous or they can be addictive if they are not properly monitored by a medical professional. So we've got to turn this attitude around and have people recognize that prescription medications can be dangerous, can be addictive, and you should never use them unless you are directly under the doctor's care. Now, we have polled high school and junior high students and they have given us some frightening responses. About a third of them believe that it's, it's less dangerous to use someone else's prescription than it is to smoke marijuana. I'm no fan of marijuana, and, I, I, and I, we could do a whole nother presentation on the problems with that, but seriously, they think they can take someone else's prescriptions and it's less dangerous? That, that is a myth we need to break down, and we're doing it through what we call our dose of reality. And the dose of reality is, is that prescription painkillers are killing more people than heroin and cocaine combined in Wisconsin. They're far more dangerous. You'll see this, this logo on the bottom of the screen. I want to make sure I find the button for the laser. Uh, here we go. You see this logo, the skull and the crossbones on a prescription bottle. Um, a little shocking. We intended it to be shocking. Um, and now when we developed this, we worked with the Medical Society, the Hospital Association, the Dental Association, and the Pharmacy Society, and the Nursing Association were all at the table developing this logo. They were a little bit shocked by it. I will never forget something Dr. McNett uh, said when he saw it. Uh, when he saw the tagline, Dose of Reality, and saw that, he, his reaction was, nobody needs a dose of reality more than the medical community. So we've gone forward, and the resistance has, has withered away. Um, because we, we need to shock people a little bit. And of course, that, that skull and crossbones on a prescription bottle is always accompanied by this message, Present, prevent prescription painkiller abuse. That's what we're going after. If it's, it's, and I'll, I'll cover some slides in a moment that'll explain that. These are the numbers I said that it was causing more, that the uh, prescription painkillers are causing more deaths than heroin and cocaine combined. Look at, what, look at what the numbers look like. The blue, num the blue line is the o our opioid deaths. The orange line, climbing, is heroin. And then we have uh, the, 
the red line are methadone deaths. The pain clinics he talked about, this is one, this is in Florida, and um, this is a DEA camera set up outside of a pill mill. Gentleman on the, that's going to walk up on the right side in the black, might be a rock concert t-shirt, he goes by the name Doctor. This is not sped up or slowed down, this is one minute in real time. This is 9 a.m. and the doctor's stepping up to unlock the front door of the pain clinic. A, a responsible doctor can't treat this many people in a week. This guy's going to knock off this many in 15 minutes. Watch the green car. That's my favorite one. That's not the kind of car you expect a drug addict to be driving, right? You know, we all read these stories. Uh, we, we see the news reports. Um, we see community presentations with parents who've, who've buried their children people who've watched uh, family members just suffer so much. And we're capable of, of great empathy, and we feel terrible for them, for those people. Um, we do kind of shield ourselves, though, with this notion that it can't happen to us, that this is just happening to the, quote, bad kids. I have met well over 500 parents in Wisconsin who have buried their children. I've met some in other states, too. I was in Arkansas the other day and met a number there. I have yet to meet the parent who thought their child was the bad kid. This is affecting kids from all walks of life. I will, I'll give you one example. Many of these parents are very, very persuasive at convincing you that their kids were the good kid. And I'll give you one example. I had one set of parents sat across me at a table when I was in the DA's office. And um, we're talking about their son who died from a heroin overdose. One of the things they showed me was his high school transcript. He had a perfect grade point average when he graduated high school in Waukesha County. And he didn't make it to 20 before he was dead from heroin. Less than a year and a half after he graduated high school, he's gone. And these parents don't know what happened. Um, it is affecting all kinds of kids. It is in your, your church community. It's in your school district. It is in your city. It is in your town, and you need to take it seriously. These are, this is the culprit, and here's part of why this is such a culprit. These, this is an 80 milligram Oxycontin. They go for about a buck a milligram on the street. That's pretty good, right? Um, you know, I, the uh, police officer back there, I, he's going to have to yell to answer this. Uh, Sergeant, is it? Sergeant, what, uh, what's a drug dealer look like these days? Yeah, what's a drug dealer look like? Looks like anybody else on yeah, this is, the, this is the problem. If, uh, if a teenager grabs some of these from their parents' uh, medicine cabinet or their grandparents' medicine cabinet and shares or sells them to somebody they know from school, they are a drug dealer. And this, that temptation to make money off of this is, is really confounding us. Um, another Another one of the myths is about where these drugs come from. Okay, we've talked about pill mills, we've talked about problems with prescribing, but most of them don't come directly from a doctor. We, of course, are concerned about, uh, about drug dealers and that are selling things on the street, but the dose of reality is almost 71% of the time when someone starts abusing prescription painkillers, taking them improperly, they didn't get them from a drug dealer or from a doctor. They got them from a family member or a friend. They stole them or someone shared their prescription. Now, by the way, that is an encouraging number because if we can secure these things in our home, if we can take care of what's in our own homes, we can knock out 70% of the problem. We never have numbers like that in law enforcement or public health. And then, the other part of this is we, can, we have a lot of concern about heroin. We've talked a lot about heroin. We should. It's very frightening. And we're on to fentanyl, something much more dangerous. But the bottom line is four out of five, almost 80% of the people who start using heroin first became addicted to prescription painkillers. This is another great number for us. 
because if we can control prescriptions in our homes, we knock out 70% of the problem, and that knocks out 80% of the heroin problem, we could come to a day, if we all play our part, that we don't even have to talk about heroin anymore in Wisconsin. You know, talk about, uh, I, I said this is the most serious problem we have and we've ever seen. The green line on here are motor vehicle crashes. The orange line are falls. They're still number one, barely, for accidental death in Wisconsin. The blue line are, are drug overdoses. The last numbers we have are from 2013. I don't understand why these are the last numbers we have. I would think, I, I'm like you, I think I have common sense. I would think we'd have the 2015 numbers now, but somewhere in government these haven't been put together yet. But these latest numbers from 2013 have drug overdose climbing and about to overtake falls. We've seen the trends continue. We expect that when we do get the 2014 and 15 numbers that the number one cause of accidental death in Wisconsin will be a drug overdose. And most, about 75% of those are prescription opioids. That is also true nationwide. Alre nationwide already, they are the number one cause of accidental death, drug overdoses. You know, it's easy to think that it's kind of an urban problem. Uh, maybe that doesn't give you any comfort because you're kind of urban, you're close to Milwaukee, but the truth is when we look at Wisconsin, now that chart I showed you way back at the beginning, it spanned 2000 to 2013 with that line going up. Well, by 2008, we were, we were well into this problem. I'm starting on 2008. This is a little bit misleading because this shows heroin submissions to the crime lab. You don't send heroin to the crime lab for testing until you have a case set for a jury trial. So this, the numbers way far understate because 99 point something percent of cases don't go to trial. They never get the drugs tested. The numbers way understate the, the, the problem. What, I, what I'm focusing on are the colors. And you recognize some of these colors, some of these counties that are in red here. Milwaukee, of course, Waukesha, Dane County, the three biggest counties, Brown County next in line, it's orange. It's starting, it was starting to get pretty bad in 2008. Most of the counties were in white, hadn't submitted any crime lab, uh, heroin to the crime lab, somewhere into that yellow, and it was starting, they were starting to see those cases uh, getting ready for trial. I'm gonna flash ahead two years at a time. 2010, a lot more red. Look at this one up here, Marinette County. About 41,000 people live in that county. It's huge geographically, but it's pretty small, pretty rural um, when it comes to the population. Problem was, and um, problem was, and this, this is representative Ni John Nigren's district. Um, across the border in Menominee, Michigan, there was one of those doctors who was prescribing for a profit. And he got a whole, whole lot of people, probably thousands of people in Marinette County addicted to prescription painkillers. And when the DEA busted him and locked him up in prison, all those people in Marinette County that were addicted to the painkillers had to find another way to satisfy their addiction. And the only option they had, heroin. So all of a sudden, Marinette County had more heroin submissions to the crime lab than Dane County. We've added in Rock, all these other, Walworth County, Racine County, Washington County, all these counties coming up red. Two, two years more forward, there's not much white left on the state, is there? A lot more red. Look at Douglas County, Superior. Are you kidding me? There's a lot of trees in Douglas County. Um, and 2014, lots and lots of red. You can see the jump here between 2008 and 2014 in six years, how much the color of Wisconsin changed on this problem. And it's of course not just the deaths. These are, this is the chart for hospital inpatient emergency department and emergency department admissions for opiate overdoses. Um, they quadrupled in about a decade. Um, who, who pays for that, by the way? We do. Because by the time you're overdosing on these drugs, typically you, you don't have a job with insurance anymore. You don't have anything covering you. 
So even if you can't work up sympathy and empathy for the people suffering, if all you can think about it from is from this pure pocketbook perspective, you should do something because it's costing us a fortune. How, how, how are hospitals supposed to eat that cost as they quadruple in the number of people showing up with heavy duty need for emergency help? These are the people that the ambulance service couldn't bring back to life with Narcan out on the street. They're heading them to the hospital because they need more intervention. I can't, I don't, I won't have time to talk about our heroin battle here very much, but heroin is in Wisconsin because there's a demand for heroin in Wisconsin. But this isn't our first battle with it. We've had, we have a bat, we have an epidemic of heroin about every 40 years in America, but this one's different. We've never seen these kind of deaths. We've never seen it be so pervasive. And there are two reasons. One, we have a new introductory drug, the painkillers. The other one, we don't get our heroin from the same place. So most people start with the pills, they become addicted. Eventually they switch over to heroin when the pills become too expensive and too difficult to find. It does, now many of the people who die from overdoses from the pills, remember most people, more people are dying from the pills overdosing than from heroin. So many of them don't even get to heroin. But by the time they die, they're usually shooting up, meaning that they are strapping on a tourniquet, looking for a vein, and putting a needle in their arm. And then when the tracks on their arms become too, too obvious to people, they start injecting under their tongue or between their toes. Can you imagine sticking a needle between your toes? But they are desperate to have no one find out what they're doing. And there are signs. You know, I, someone close to me um, was, uh, is uh, struggling with heroin addiction. And, you know, family members thought it was odd that in summer he had long sleeves on, but nobody thought possibly that he could be using drugs. Well, sure enough, he was. And now, so he had long sleeves on on hot days because he covered, he didn't want us to see his arms. So what... What are the sources of the prescription medications? Well, we are overprescribed. Um, we have seen, uh, in 2014, we collected over 34,000 pounds in our drug take back day. Uh, May of 15, over 39,000 pounds. Now, we announced this Dose of Reality campaign in September of 2015. Less than a month later, we upped it to 44,000 pounds. That is two semi trucks full. We didn't have room for one more pallet in there of uh, medications emptied out of the bottles into boxes. And at 44,000 pounds, that's net weight. That's the drugs, not any, not the boxes or pallets. April of 2016, we shattered the record, over 64,000 pounds. So the campaign had been in place about, about nine months. And, you know, not even nine months. But after that period of time, we collected this much. That tells me that Wisconsin's getting it. That that they're seeing the need to do things differently, to turn these get these medications out of their homes. Um, by the way, that made us number three in America for the drug take back. Do it, we do it nationwide. Um, only California and Texas were ahead of us. And California only collected 200 pounds more than Wisconsin. 30, 33 to 35 million people in California, but they're probably not as heavily prescribed as Wisconsin. No, we did a great job. Uh, we just did our most recent one two weeks ago, and I didn't update this slide. Uh, we collected just under 59,000 pounds. In two years, four collections, we collected 207,000 pounds of, of unused medications in Wisconsin. Um, that is 10 semi-truck trailers full. Um, that, those are medications that are not in our water table. They're safely incinerated, but more importantly, they're not diverted out for someone to abuse on the streets. Those are amazing, those are amazing numbers, and I said at the beginning, I'm proud of what Wisconsin is doing because we do get it. Here was, um, this was back in, I think, this was, over, this was a year ago at the collection, um, but here you see what we do. We, we load them into boxes, we shrink wrap them, pallet them, and loaded them with forklifts onto semi-trailers. What do you do if you want to get rid of medications from your home? Well, you missed the uh, drug take back day two, day two weeks ago today. No worries. 
we have almost 300, I think it's 297 now, medication return units all around the state of Wisconsin. If you want to find out where one is, go to doseofrealitywi.gov, enter your zip code, and it will show you the closest 24-7 medication return unit. You can go in, there's one in the West Dallas Police Department, I think in both, yes. yeah, both, both uh, of their district stations. You can walk in, open the thing, drop your medications in and walk away. No one's gonna hassle you or ask you any questions. We don't, re we don't have time to sit and read through all the bottles. Frankly, we prefer you don't give us the bottles. Uh, if you can, put them in a Ziploc bag, throw them in, because that saves the officers the time to open up all those child-proof caps and empty them into bags themselves. We're gonna save a lot of officers carpal tunnel syndrome if, we, uh, if you do that for them. But you can find out how to do this easily. Just go online, enter your zip code, and you can find places close to you on your way to work, on your way to dropping the kids off at school, whatever. Get these things out of your bathrooms, out of your medicine cabinets. Now, that other part, most eventually do use heroin. I come up on five minutes, thank you. Most eventually do use heroin if they stay alive that long because it's cheaper and it's easier to find. Um, but the problem is, is our heroin now doesn't come from Southeast and Southwest Asia anymore. It used to. It now comes from south of the border. Mexican, Central American, and South American drug cartels are producing the heroin that's for sale on American streets. And because it's easier to get it here, they can manipulate the purity levels. And, oops, gotta point out. The, look at, two, in 1980, or the 1980s, the average purity of heroin for, for sale on the street was three to eight percent. So 95 percent of it was an inert cutting agent. By 2013, the national average was 15 to 26 percent. Because it was much more potent, you could snort it or smoke it when you first started using it. You didn't have to start with injecting. They do eventually. And it, the price dropped dramatically because it's easier to get it here. But here's Milwaukee. Here's why we've, been, we've had such a major problem in Wisconsin. Our average in 2003 was 67% pure. Not five, 67% pure retail for sale on the street. How, you know, is it any wonder we started having so many overdose deaths, so many people dying? It dropped back down. Once they secured their market, once they aced out the Asian markets, well then they dropped it back down. But they've continued to hover around 30% because they still make enormous profits. They don't have to go any lower. 30% gets people addicted a lot faster than five, so they like keeping it there. And now, and we still see levels over 70% for sale on the street, and um, remember that 30% is the average. Um, and now we've got fentanyl and carfentanyl, 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. And here's just a drug test result, 77% pure, that was for, that was bought on the street in Milwaukee by an undercover agent. And of course, it's a bigger problem. It's linked to robbery, identity theft, burglary, uh, human trafficking, regular theft. All these things have spiked dramatically because of this problem, because people who become addicted have to find a way to support this habit. And unfortunately, they have to turn to crime for it. So we've, we've tried a lot of different things here. We, we, of course, I'm a law enforcement guy, so our first reaction was, let's get out there, let's arrest some dealers. Well, rewind back to when crack cocaine was a big problem here. It's still a problem, but not like it was. What would we do? We'd get enough users who would tell us the address where they bought the stuff, we'd get a search warrant, we'd kick in the door, we would get their drugs, their money, their guns, we'd lock them up, and we solved the problem kind of from the supply side. We have a problem now because this is what a drug house looks like. Not this phone exactly. But <laughs> they, they use a throwaway phone that they use for a couple weeks at most. They use a, often a stolen car. They'll meet you in a fast food parking lot. Nobody even, even if that drug user wanted to help us find the dealer, they can't. They don't know anymore. Um, plus, we have a little problem. In 2013 survey, we found that in Wisconsin there were over 163,000 people abusing opiates in some manner in this state, either pills or heroin. We can't and shouldn't lock up 163,000 people. Drug treatment courts have been a great addition to what we're doing. 
Medication assisted treatment is doing great things, but in the end, we have got to stop the flow in. This boat is gonna sink. We ought to fix the leak, but we have to stop pouring in more buckets of water too, or this boat's sinking. So that's why we focused on prevention. And I wanna just end with this. We have a very simple message on this prevention thing. It's, it's mind blowing how simple this is. Do you remember that 70% number and that 80% number? Use your prescriptions only as they're prescribed to you. No sharing. Store them safely and securely. Nobody would put a loaded handgun on the counter of their home with teenagers coming in and out of the house. That would be insane. And yet, not enough people yet think about what's in their medicine cabinet. And what's in their medicine cabinet is killing a lot more people than handguns. And then finally, the third piece of the message, dispose of them properly and promptly when you're done taking them. Don't hang on to them. If you're thinking that someday I might have some pain and I want these things when that comes, if you have pain that, that warrants the prescribing of a narcotic, you should be talking to your doctor. You should not become Dr. Bob or whatever your first name is and prescribe this to yourself. Um, besides, empty out, those, empty out that drawer or that cabinet. You, you got another empty drawer. You can buy more socks, whatever. But you can, make, you can have all that extra room. And here's some of the resources we have on our website. Go to doseofrealitywi.gov. If you are a parent, a coach, a teacher, an employer, a medical professional, any of these things, we have places where you can go on there and you can find resources. They're print ready. You can download and print them. You can, you can put your own logo on them or you can ask us and we'll put your logo on them. We're in this together. We want to show partnerships. So. We want to show you, you are, you are invested with us at your school, your medical facility, your place of employment, you name it. So you can find, you can even find PowerPoint presentations. If you want to go talk to somebody, you want to talk to a group in your neighborhood about this issue, you can find a PowerPoint presentation you can customize to do that. If you're a coach, you want to talk to your ath student athletes, you can find all these things. Check it out, doseofrealitywi.gov. You can find so many resources there. And then give us feedback. Tell us what are the resources we can put there because we're gonna, we have to beat this problem. And we're gonna do it together as a state with all of us hand in hand, all hands on deck. We can beat this. If we don't work at it though, it will beat us. So thank you very much for being here today and for all your efforts.